addressing like how we're going to deal with the food crisis. So one of the big issues with global warming is that our coastline is going away. The other one is how are we going to continue to produce enough food. So for each degree that we warm the planet, we lose about 6% of our global yield of wheat. 6% of wheat. for each degree. Um, so that's a lot of people going hungry. Uh, and so one of the solutions there is, oh, well, you know, we'll just bioengineer better wheat that can survive. And, but then when you buy bioengineer something, a company owns those genetics. They own the genome of that plant. Um, so we're taking the power away from local people and giving it to big multinational corporations as an example of a solution that causes more problems. I think that's a beautiful example. And I think uh, the point you raised, Max, goes to the heart of the issue, uh, which is in terms of fiction, uh, you know, simply using the post capitalistic toolbox is really problematic. I remember reading an article not long ago about a similar complaint about why a fiction becoming almost exclusively dystopian in recent memory. And, and uh, the issue with that is that, you know, it's a, it's a failure of the imagination. If you can only imagine what we'll do to pick up after ourselves after the apocalypse, it's ultimately, is if you look at a lot of dystopian YA fiction, it pits an individual against uh, a society that is, you know, problematic in many ways. And then, you know, the individual somehow ruptures the, the, the problem problems of that society, leaves or drugs or whatever. But rarely do we see explorations in science fiction of communities that work, that are not totalitarian and that work. And I think that's pr probably because we've all become way too individualistic and I don't care if wants to oh, shout out something. Well, it was remarked 60 years ago that it's very hard to get a good novel length concept for the utopia. I'm not talking about utopia. I mean, utopia is one end of the spectrum. But I'm talking about realistic, uh, nitty gritty, uh, working through stuff that's difficult, uh, in which involves relationships between people and uh, developing technologies. I think we do things the wrong way around. You know, technologies are thrust upon us. But what about, like, you know, technologies that arise from people's needs? rather than the other way around. Um, but, but also, in general, uh, I really do believe that it's a failure of the imagination. And so one of the things that, uh, that I mentioned very briefly, I've been experimenting with, it's a little hard in short fiction, but um, uh, taking apart the, the idea of the short story and the novel as we conceive it as a story of an individual pitted against stuff. I mean, after all, what is an individual? Like, uh, under certain circumstances, the notion makes sense, but in other circumstances, you know, might be, say, female and Indian, uh, ha and, uh, you know, having certain, whatever, political views or certain scientific training is completely irrelevant to kind of, say, running through a forest. And just there, I'm just an animal. So, like, and, and, you know, where do I end? Like, do I end where my skin ends? Or is it the electromagnetic fields that we carry around with us? Uh, so, so, you know, so, societally and physically and biologically, I think it's important to, to deal with some of these underlying issues when we talk about the climate. And um, uh, if I can, uh, well, why don't you jump in? And then I have, I have a little article to share with you from the tribe from uh, west, uh, in eastern India that might be in Egypt. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, just uh, this quick that, that came back to you. Um, that this is one of the potentials that science fiction and fantasy really have to address these problems, though, I think, because there is a tradition in both uh, genres of communities pitted against some sort of enormous obstacle. And one book that's coming by right now is MJ Locks Off Against It, which isn't exactly climate fiction. It's the story of an asteroid colony that's confronted with a huge um, lack of water. And as a result, like, fuel and like, food and everything, uh, as a result of industrialized how they try to come together and manipulate their own situation to save all disaster. Like that's that is a trope that is in the short So anyway, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to point out one other thing so I but um, there's, a, there's a friend of mine who's an environmentalist working in India, and uh, um, uh, one time he was, um, so there's this tribe in Eastern India that uh, lives, you know, a very different life, so, you know, they live in the forest and, and they, uh, they're not cut off from, uh, from modernity, but they are, they mostly live the traditional lifestyles. Well, their, their hills and forests are threatened by a coal mining company, 
and the government had granted permission to this company and so on. So they took their fight all the way to the Indian Supreme Court and utterly surprisingly they won. And so um, this kind of one who is going to go visit them when I talked to them last uh, because he said that interestingly what had happened in the aftermath of the victory was this, that various development officials and so on had said, uh, you know, they were completely flabbergasted by the tribes refusal to let the mining company come and basically flatten their borders. <laughs> and they said, well, don't you want the benefits of civilization? Don't you want, you know, roads and cars and televisions and all that? Uh, and these people, uh, they basically uh, looked at these development options no. And then, uh, they, they, but then what that stimulated was a discussion amongst that community as to what do we want? What, is, what does happiness mean for us? We don't want to be cut off from the world, but at the same time, we have seen what it's like in the cities. We've seen the pollution, we've seen how miserable everyone seems to look all the time. And so on. That's not what we want. And we don't need uh, this stuff. You know, we don't need televisions and cars and things. And you know, what we want, we get. So from our perspective, we of work because they have nothing, but from another perspective, they have everything because they're not starving, they're living in common, very rich forests of uh, So, but then, the, the, and then when you think about the, the amazing uh, audacity of the question, what makes me happy, what makes us happy, what is happiness, what is well-being for us, if you think about it, most of the time we're letting other people, companies, corporations, whatever, define what that means. But to ask that question to ourselves, maybe and maybe that's the heart of the climate issue that we need to figure out what well-being means for us uh, as, a, as a global uh, as a species. Well, it's, it's amazing. I'm the right, right answer. If I might, uh, responding to that, uh, um, has uh, in one sense that's the answer is it's got nothing to do with writing science fiction stories. <laughs> it's got to do in some sense. It's, it's, a, it's about values. And some of us as writers, of course, attempt to convey that kind of thing in our writing. Some of us aren't interested in that kind of a issue or problem. But a close to home story, not a foreign example, but a, a domestic one. Um, at my house, just after I left, the local environmental organization's fundraisers came around and they tend to be young people just out of college or just in college. Um, doing fund soliciting, and they came, and my they, my wife mentioned, oh, we're off the grid, and, and they said, oh, great, how many panels do you have? Because, of course, they've been, if you've seen solar these days, and I'm sure you've seen it around here, you're looking at the, you know, the house treatment, the, the 10, 15, 20 panels, roofs, and parking lots, that kind right, of solar. Right. Yeah, just all right, morning. quick. But these young people said, how many do you have? And she said, one. And they went, what? <laughs> and they went out and they looked at it and they took a picture and they said, I gotta take these back to all the other fundraisers and show them because all we've been seeing is these systems that are gigantic and, and we can't wrap our mind around it. And that that fact, the fact that they found the single panel more interesting than the house treatment is a, is that value that, that we're looking for. And there's many, many ways to get that, but Story won't is one of them because story. Well, uh, something going on said very early uh, about what makes humans different from animals. A thought that occurred to me was narrative. Uh, you know, the notion of the Anthropocene. Uh, people talk about when, when did the Anthropocene start? Did it start uh, at the Industrial Revolution? Did it start in the 70s? And the thought that I had was it started with the first narrative because. Uh, you know, we have Gosh, to you're a writer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I guess my answer to the question of what can SS do and how can storytelling, so it's, uh, it shows the ways people cope with these things uh, and the narratives that are presented to us, uh, the non-revolutionary narratives aren't interested in showing you how to cope with things. They're interested in making you want things that they have. Uh, so what we can present is uh, the vast array of other options that they're not interested in showing us. I mean, the problem is that you have to want to read our cool ideas. Uh, I've lost a fire with them. 
I, I think that's a, that's a, you know, it's important. Why don't we, if, if there's time, perhaps, uh, talk about what we've read that we think uh, might convey, or what we've written that we think might convey some of what we'd like to get at. I have one that I'm always uh, dropping out, which is uh, Sherwood Nation by Benjamin Parsbach. It came out from Small Beer Press last year. Uh, it's about Portland, Oregon, uh, in a time of drought. When I read it last year, I thought, oh, this is a speculative thing like Portland will never be a drought because they had that very nice wet climate. And now, suddenly, it's like 100 degrees there every day. Uh, and I'm shocked. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a social science fiction. It's near future social science fiction. Uh, it's not quite dystopian. Uh, and it shows, you know, it has a city mayor struggling with these issues, water shortages. And it has a bunch of really interesting solutions. Uh, everybody builds um, outhouses so they don't have to flush their toilets. Uh, but it's about the people who step forward to lead when the traditional structures fail. And uh, I found it to just be eye opening in the way that it made me think about the. What was that the title of this? Uh, Sherwood Nation, it's called. Um, very specific problems and, and like small community solutions to them. So my example from earlier was Hello Papa Loopy's Wind Up Girl. Getting on Kim Stanley Robinson, I really enjoy 2312 and the sort of optimistic vision of how all this works out. Like what are some possible solutions that could build us a better region? Yeah, I mentioned a couple. Um, I just want to mention, actually, Kim Stanley Robinson's Pacific Edge, I thought, is a beautiful piece of work. And uh, I did not like 2312, but that's a different conversation. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, it's a perfect uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Another occasion. But, uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, I apologize, my head is coming, so I'm blanking out on names, but uh, there's a writer, Caitlin, uh, who's written some incredible short stories. That are kind of semi apocalyptic, but they show people dealing with stuff and they show people living in alternate groups than nuclear families, um, which is really interesting. Um, and then, of course, uh, there, there are, uh, and I just want to mention that I've been experimenting with, uh, uh, I guess, applying chaos theory to human systems. I wrote a story called Entanglement for Project, it's in the Project Hieroglyph Anthology, came out last year. Uh, but uh, I think that this is happening more and more. In fact, someone has, has termed this kind of fiction fly fire, which I'm not sure is kind of interesting. But uh, I, I still haven't made up my mind about that. Uh, but I think that uh, perhaps if there's some way that we can encourage more people, especially science fiction writers, to write about the real coming apocalypse, uh, that might be something that is useful. The, the real question is it how do you write about climate change? How do you not write about climate change? Right. Yeah, it's, sort of, it's going to become the backdrop. Yeah, but but one other aspect that can, I'm thinking in terms of is it an appropriate theme for the sci-fi genre? It's, it's an ob obviously appropriate theme because there isn't an individual solution. I mean, it, it may in fact be like the nuclear issue, which actually isn't resolved. The nuclear weapons issue is not resolved. Um, we tend to forget that there's another big threat hanging over us. But it's those moments that, that science fiction has often explored wonderfully. It's a time for all of humanity needing a transformation. Because it's not going to work if only some of us solve this problem, because you can't some of us solve it. On the other hand, there's that nice, tempting, classic science fiction solution of you know the mad scientist or the, the individual who either solves the problem or escapes the problem. And there's that wonderful escape description of, you know, going down the world, leaving the Earth behind in its little mess. And um, those are temptations, too. But um, Sorry for you to get to what escape is. But we're, we're basically out of time. Alas, if anyone has any last time, I'd love to thank you. I was in the Arctic last year for an academic project on climate change. 
And uh, one of the things that struck me, and it's related to what you just said, is that it is everyone's problem. And you know, we have all these uh, major and, and justified concerns about diversity in science fiction. Well, um, here are two things to think about which are connected to both diversity and climate change. Uh, one is that the people at the receiving end of the horrors of climate change are basically uh, not the ones who caused it. And secondly, those people are not just victims, they are people who have solutions, uh, at least in our alternate ways of being that might be useful to us. So I think it's important to look at that aspect. Okay, thanks everyone.